And now for something completely different. Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. Good morning and welcome to, well, the second day of one of the busier weeks of earnings that we're going to have. Of course, today is the day we get earnings from Apple, Microsoft, Google, basically you name it. They're coming out with earnings this week, especially in the big cap tech names. Tesla out yesterday announcing uh, an increase in revenue of over a billion dollars. So, again, um, you know, that stock's going to be in kind of the focus this morning as uh, it's had a, a nice little run up here lately. So, again, you know, one of the big challenges, of course, going forward for electric vehicle, like for Tesla in particular, is, of course, going to be the increased level of competition now from well, all other automakers, you know, Ford is, is now really entering that market hard along with GM and others. So, again, increased competition in electric vehicles, pricing, delivery, all those type of things will eventually start to, to erode margins for really for electric vehicle makers kind of really everywhere. So uh, it's going to be one kind of the things to watch today is to watch what happens with Tesla, how markets are going to be viewing their earnings report yesterday and kind of their outlook for their market going through the rest of this year. Um, again, uh, this morning and this afternoon, uh, both today and tomorrow, uh, some very big tech earnings. So that's going to really be driving markets really over the next day or so. Question is going to be is that you know a lot of these tech stocks have had tremendous runs here as of late. So it's going to be really more the question of not how good their earnings are, but really what their outlook looks like. And that's going to be one thing really kind of driving those prices. And of course, the markets as well. Markets are going to look to open a little bit weak this morning. Not a lot. Uh, yesterday, of course, ratcheting a, a new all-time high yesterday. And again, you know, we're at the top of this kind of uh, deviation from the 50-day moving average. This has kind of been just the real running line here. And this is a really interesting chart when you look at this in particular, kind of looking back across time, going all the way back to the low of March of 2020. This has been a very, very mild in terms of advance in the markets. And it's been just a, a kind of gradual grind along this 50-day moving average. Now, one of the things is, is that this has been a period of time we've had now 179 trading days of without a 5% drawdown. This is one of the longer periods in history that you've gone through a market environment without at least a 5% drawdown. So again, a very low volatility regime. Now, something we're going to talk about in today's show is the instability of stability. And what this says is, and, and what this chart's really kind of saying is that when you have very long periods of stability, um, and again, you know, looking back at the market over the course of the last really, you know, year and a half almost now, that the market's had real no volatility. It's been a very smooth ride up, just kind of running along that 50-day moving average. And periods like this do last. They do, they do exist, right? But they don't exist forever. And that's really kind of the key point, which is that eventually now... We've had periods much longer than this, right? We had a period of 404 days back in 2019, uh, 2017, sorry. Very, very long period. Um, eventually, that eroded into the 2018, 2019, 20, early 2020 volatility pickup. So again, these don't last forever, and they do end, and you're eventually going to get a 5% correction. But also, when you take a look at a 10% correction, right? This has been kind of an abnormally long period of the markets without a 10% correction. In fact, out of the history of the markets going back to the 1930s, there's only been about eight, nine periods like this. This is one of them where you've had a very long stretch without a 10% correction. Five and 10% corrections are normal uh, for any given market year. And to go this long without a correction is simply suggesting that we have a, a period of very low volatility and it will eventually end. And uh, the problem is, is when will it end? Is it going to end at 337 days or is it going to go 1800 days? That's the problem. You don't know when it's going to end, right? So this is why you have to pay attention to how much risk you're taking in your portfolios. Uh, it doesn't mean that you want to start getting overly defensive in markets today. You don't want to get overly defensive in your portfolio today. Uh, that's something we'll talk about this morning as well, about this instability of stability, get a little bit more detail um, about how to invest in the markets right now when there's the risk of instability. 
right? And I had a question about this yesterday uh, on the show. We touched on it a little bit at the end of the show yesterday, but I'll expand on that a little bit more today. I do want to jump over the housing markets real quick because um, that was an interesting number yesterday that when we start looking at housing in particular, um, the new home sales yesterday plunged sharply. And this was one of the biggest drops that we've seen in new housing sales. Now, this is an important point because this is something we've talked about previously, talking about the fact that, well, you know, high prices are a cure for home sales. And, you know, people are complaining about high, pri high, high prices. Well, high prices will eventually cure high prices. And we've also wrote an article previously. This was in November of 2020. So, right, you have to go back to last year. We wrote an article about why there's no such thing as a housing inventory shortage. This is what cures a housing inventory shortage. And when you start taking a look at home sales in terms of, of what's happening really across the country, you're starting to see those decline rather sharply here. Why? High prices cure high prices and ultimately that is leading to this resolution of this inventory shortage right so now all of a sudden there's a lot of inventory hitting the markets why because sellers were coming to the markets and they were selling a house one you know put it up list it and sold that day that's now not occurring and houses are going up so inventory is now building and importantly, the ratio of new homes of new homes to existing homes is now below one. So that's really going to put a lot of pressure on existing home sellers to try to capture current prices. So again, what you'll see now is as sellers try to come to markets, the buyers are evaporating. That's going to lead to this reversion of supply and prices will come down on houses now over the course of the next few months. So that's really kind of the thing that we've been talking about here for a while is that you know these things that put get put out into the media like oh there's an inventory shortage just not enough homes to sell that's not true right there's plenty of inventory across the country it's just that people aren't willing to sell what happens in real estate happens on the fringes it's just simply those people willing to buy or sell at a given time but there's millions of homes out there that are potentially right for sell at the right price and everybody has a price to sell it's just depending on how much that that price is and when the prices reach that point that sellers eventually go you know what this is a really good time to sell i'm i'm thinking about i was thinking about selling maybe in two years i'm gonna go ahead and sell today because prices are so good and these may not be there um that's where this inventory shortage starts to go away and fade fairly quickly and then once prices begin to decline sellers that were going well i was going to sell in a couple of years now they see that super big valuation in their house starting to fade they rush to market to try to capture that price right i'll sell today i'm, I'm out right so that's the one thing you know psychology is always a factor in any of these types of media headlines right so whenever you see these things put out in the media is like well, this time's different because, well, it's an inventory shortage. No, it's not. It's just simply a function of supply and demand. And that's what this always comes down to. You know, the interesting story out this morning talking about semiconductor problems, right? Exactly the problem we've got right now with new cars and everything else. Well, as soon as semiconductors come back online, all of a sudden there's going to be a, a massive supply of semiconductors hitting the markets. All of a sudden, supply demand reverses and you cure the problem. And that's why inflation in those types of areas are transient, and that's a true statement, because eventually supply and demand will equal back out again, but we've got to work through the problem, right? We've got to work through that pipeline uh, supply shortage, and once that supply shortage is resolved, all prices come back down. So again, as always is the case, high prices for anything is the cure for high prices. Um, we'll come back after the break, though. We'll talk a little bit more about the Minsky moment right? And what that means for the markets, going back to this idea about how do you invest in the markets now, given valuations, where we are, and the fact that we haven't had a correction in a very long time, how do you navigate this? We'll talk about that next, right here on The Real Investment Show. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. Welcome back to the 
Roberts show this morning. I'm your host, Lance Roberts. Of course, uh, let's get into kind of our conversation this morning as um, we were discussing just a moment ago, talking about this very long period in the markets with, you know, virtually no volatility, right? It's been very, very low. There's not been a correction of more than 5% since the 2020 lows. It's a very long period in the markets. Uh, same thing for a 10% correction. Been a very long period in the markets without a 10% correction. So now be careful with that, right? So just understanding that there's risk doesn't mean that you go sit in cash, right? And this is one of the questions we had yesterday um, on our YouTube channel. So if you are watching our YouTube channel, be sure and join our live chat. We answer the questions at the end of the show. But that was one of the questions we had yesterday. I'm sitting on a lot of cash. You know, what do I do right now? You know, that's the problem that we get ourselves into. It's like, well, market's overvalued, so I shouldn't invest. Well, that's n not how it works, right? We've got to manage money for the environment that we're in right now. But understand that there's risk. And this is the thing that gets investors over time. You know, they're told by the mainstream media, oh, you've got to invest. You've got to be in. you got to buy this stock. you got to buy that stock. Well, the problem is they never tell you when to get out, right? It's always buy for the mainstream media because they've got to sell ads and they've got to sell product because that's how they stay in business. So they never tell you to sell because that's not good for their advertisers that are paying them to sell their products, right? Why? Why? And this is why a mutual fund never, you know, sells and reduces, you know, cash because they can only bill on the assets that are invested. So... Everybody has incentive to keep you invested so nobody ever tells you to sell. But just understanding that there's risk in the markets can help you navigate that risk over time. And that's the whole point of discussing these issues is just making you aware that these risks exist so that you can navigate them accordingly. You know, look, I mean, it's, it's why do you wear a seatbelt in a car, right? When, when Britt and I were growing up, Nobody wore seatbelts, right? But the cars were built like tanks. And you could you could run, you could run. I had this old, you know, uh, Dodge Plymouth that you could run into a, a house and it wouldn't even dent the car. I mean, it was full metal. And, and so, yeah, nobody had, there was no, thing, no such thing as airbags. And yes, they had seatbelts, but nobody used them. Right. I mean, nobody used the things. Because the car was built like a tank. You know, that's not the case today. The cars today, especially Tesla, right? It's all plastic. So you better have airbags and seatbelts. But why do, you, why do you have these things? It's not that you're definitely going to go out and get into a car crash. Nobody wants that, right? Same reason we buy insurance. We don't buy insurance expecting to get into an auto crash. But we buy it just in case. And that's the, the point of understanding what we're talking about. We know there's risk in driving a vehicle. We know that eventually, potentially, probably, we're going to have an accident at some point. Hopefully it's minor, right? Hopefully it's a little fender bender. But sometimes it's not. And so we want to be prepared for that. And that's why we have insurance. That's why we have seatbelts. That's why we have airbags. We have all these things to protect us in the event that something bad happens. But when it comes to the financial markets, we're like, <laughs> need seatbelts. I'm all in and leveraged. I'm going to drive my Tesla as fast as it can go without touching the brakes ever between point A and point B, right? You may get there. You may not. The same thing for the markets and investing, right? And we, and we invest like we're driving a car with no seatbelts as fast as we can. That's how we invest. So, it's important to understand this, but this is the point of today's article talking about the Minsky moment. We, we're in a period, and we touched on this in this past weekend's newsletter, and I wanted to expand on that a bit today because what Hyman Minsky talked about, he says, long periods of exuberance in markets are created by stability and it's, and it's created by a psychological phenomenon. And, you know, that manifests itself in terms of things like this time is different or the Fed's got our back or all these type of things. And there is a basis for that, right? But that's that psychosis that takes over the markets. And we have these very accelerated runs in markets with very low volatility. But the point of what Hyman Minsky was talking about is that stability 
ultimately leads to instability. And we can go back, you know, throughout history and really kind of look at some of these things. But, you know, part of, you know, the idea of exuberance in markets is, is manifest itself in terms of what's driving the markets. So, for instance, if you take a look at the Fed balance sheet, of course, you know, there's a lot of commentary from people saying, well, the Fed doesn't really affect the financial markets. OK, you believe that if you want, because all you do is look at a correlation between the Fed balance sheet and the financial markets. And that pretty much tells you the case. There's nearly an 80 percent correlation between expansions and contractions of the Fed balance sheet and the financial markets. So it's not surprising. You know, and this is this is problematic, I should say, at some point, because when we're all dependent upon one source of support for the financial markets, then that becomes problematic for when the Fed eventually does have to taper or does have to raise interest rates. But but what Hyman Minsky was talking about specifically was about these long periods create lots of speculative exuberance in the markets, you know, and, and we've seen this, right? We've seen retail traders, you know, run into the markets. Uh, we've talked about how retail traders are taking on a lot of options risk by, you know, delving into the options market leverage. We've seen record increases in, in terms of these special acquisition companies, SPACs, to take companies public that really shouldn't be public to start with. Um, of course, you know, we've seen, also, you know, record amounts of IPOs of money losing companies coming to markets, Wall Street trying to meet demand. Um, and, and this has been a year in particular. We've had more merger and acquisition deals this year than we've had just about any other year in history. Why? Because there's lots of money in the markets. Lots of liquidity. So I might as well put that money to work, especially when I've got super high stock prices that I can use as currency to buy another company. You're going to see a lot of M&A deals. And you're seeing a lot of that where companies are taking the value of their stock and using that exceptionally high market capitalization to buy other companies. Smart on their business. I mean, it's smart for the company to do that. But this is just a, a function of where we are in the markets. So Again, kind of going back to this, this premise of low volatility and high volatility, you know, we can go back through history, going back to, you know, even to 2000. And this goes back all through history, right? This is nothing new. I just selected a period of, you know, the last 22 years. Um, but you can see there's periods of high volatility where markets are declining. That's followed by a period of low volatility, high volatility in 2008, obviously, where, where prices were collapsing. And then you had a very low period of volatility in you know, 2011, 2012, 2013. Then, then, of course, you had the Fed trying to start talking about taper tantrum. You know, they're going to taper their balance sheet in 2015, 2016. You had Brexit. That led to a period of high volatility. You had two 20% declines almost back to back at that point. Then we got back in 2017. The Fed goes, oh, never mind. We're not really going to do that. <laughs> And 20, 2017 was a period of extremely low volatility. You had you had less, you had a year without a one percent decline in the markets. I mean, it's just a very low volatility period. And then that led to 2018, where you had two 20 percent plus declines. 2019 was a bit choppy, and then of course you had the 35 percent decline in 2020. So, a period of low volatility followed by a period of high volatility. And now here we are back at another period of exceptionally low volatility. So if we have a period of exceptionally low volatility, what is due, due to follow at some point is a period of high volatility. But the question becomes when? And that's the problem that we can't answer, right? We don't know when that's going to occur. But one of the things that Hyman Minsky particularly talked about in, in his theory is that excessive bullish, you know, um, Outlooks and speculation lead to leverage and leverage in markets. And of course, you know, if you take a look at the kind of easiest way to look at leverage in the financial markets is through margin debt, which has just hit a, a brand new all time high in terms of record margin debt. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with margin debt, it provides excess capital to buy more stocks, which pushes prices higher. That's great. But margin debt also works in reverse. It's like gasoline. 
And so when you start getting the reversal in the markets and you start getting margin calls, it accelerates the decline. And that's the one thing we always tend to forget about margin debt is that it's fine and dandy on the upside. It can really boost our returns and it's it's lots of fun to take on, <laughs> you know, leverage and, and make money with it, right? Um, but the problem with margin is, is that when you start getting margin calls, it's a forced liquidation. You don't have a choice. You will either sell to meet your margin call or the brokerage firm that issued you the margin debt will sell it for you. And it will be done indiscriminately or you better come up with more cash. But that's the problem on the downside. And this this feeds into the whole issue of the markets. Now, you know, when this thing starts to unwind eventually, right? That's where you can get your 5% correction, you get your 10% correction. And if it catches fire, that's where you get your ultimately your 20 percent correction or more right what causes that again we don't know does it happen today does it happen tomorrow does it happen next week next month next quarter next year don't know i've got an article coming out in the next week or so talking about you know the the key triggers of recessions and bear markets and of course you know the thing to watch the most is now the fed and coming up in the next couple of weeks we're gonna start hearing more talk about What's going to happen at Jackson Hole? Are they going to talk about tapering? Are they going to talk about rate hikes? Probably not. But that's the thing that eventually gets the markets. So again, it's not about being bearish. It's just understanding that there's risk and making sure that while you're driving your car, you're wearing your seatbelt and have airbags. Be right back after the break. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. So, you know, this is going to be an interesting outcome. So, I do these spreadsheets and, you know, Brent will attest to this is, you know, I run a lot of data. We crunch a lot of numbers and we use a lot of historical data going back to really the 1800s. And some of these spreadsheets are so large that um, you've got to have a computer with a little bit of horsepower to it in order to process them. So um, about 10 years ago, when I started doing this a whole lot more, I started buying gaming computers to do my work with because they had enough power, processing power to crunch these spreadsheets. And so one of the the companies that I've bought several computers from now, um, just for this reason, is Dell. And they have a a line of gaming computers called Alienware. And these are high-end gaming machines and, you know, with high-end graphics and things like that, which, you know, if you're playing video games, this is very important. There's, you know, if you're, if you're not a video gamer, the the difference between life and death in these video games is frame rate. And because if your frame rate is running slower than the person that you're competing against, they're going to win because they're going to see you before you see them. And so this is one of the big challenges for gamers that are serious about it is making sure that they have the video graphic capability and most importantly, the frame rates per second to compete. Now, why am I telling you about this? What does this have to do with anything, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> if you're a competitive gamer, which a lot of youngsters are these days, you want to start competing against people that live in where? California, Colorado, Hawaii, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington. Now, what do these states all have in common? California, Colorado, Hawaii, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington. No, it's not smoking dope, okay? (laughs) These are all very Democratic-leaning states, yeah, who are very much into making sure that we have climate change efficiency, correct? Yes. They've now passed a new rule about power consumption, And according to Dell, and in the latest announcement, if you want to order a high-end gaming computer from Dell, 
you will not get it if you live in one of those states because here's the statement from Dell. The product, uh, they're speaking specifically about their Aurora R12 gaming desktop. This is one of their Alienware lines. The product cannot be shipped to states of California, Colorado, Hawaii, Oregon, Vermont, or Washington due to power consumption regulations adopted by those states. Any orders placed that are bound for those states will be canceled. Now, this is, an, and, and the reason this is interesting, right, it's, it's just, you know, my son plays video games. I, I think every kid does these days. But, you know, these video games are not the video games that you and I grew up with. You know, when I grew up, video games was Pong <laughs> on a 19-inch on a black and white television. And it was just the little, there was two bars and the little dot, boop, 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 right? That was it. That was video games. And then it migrated to, you know, 8-bit characters and very choppy and Atari and those type of things. That was video games when we were growing up. Today, these are serious businesses. Hundreds of millions of dollars of value in these video games that are produced. And they are produced now like they produce a movie. I mean, a lot of these video games today have high-end actors that are portraying the characters in these movies, right? From Kevin Spacey to um, a variety of others, right? So they hire high-end actors. They spend $100 million, $200 million making these games, of which they will then sell them and make several hundred million dollars on these games. So this is serious business. And again, for gamers that are serious about gaming, having access to high-end computers and gaming computers in particular for this, because these require so much memory and so much capacity to generate and drive video, and particularly, like I said earlier, frame rates per second, this is going to make the difference between those who succeed and those who fail. And this is a very competitive thing with the younger generation, right? Yes, I agree. They're spending way too much time playing video games, but it, it is what it is. But I find it interesting now that you're starting to see these regulations that are getting passed now starting to impact the choices of consumers. Now, we may say, hey, you know what? It's just a video game computer. Who cares? Well, it's not just that. It's what everything else that also requires consumption of electricity. So what about... You know, when this gets to the point to where you want to go buy an air conditioner for your house or a refrigerator or anything else that takes power consumption, are you going to be limited in those options of what you can buy? Yes, it's just video game computers today. But what about tomorrow? And these are all, these are all the consequences, right, of the actions that we take. And the things that we do and the impact is always at the surface is like, oh, this is good for X, right? This is good for the environment. Awesome. No problem with that. Let's do things that are good for the environment. But we also have to measure that against the impact. And again, computers, who cares? Today. Tomorrow could be a different story. What, what, what is it that requires a lot of power consumption? How about electric vehicles? I mean, we're all moving to this phase. And in these states in particular, they're the ones going, hey, we need to have electric vehicles because we need to reduce commission, emissions. But how much power consumption do those take? And do those start to get limited in terms of battery size, range, et cetera? because of power consumption requirements. I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just making the example. So all of a sudden, if you live in California, you can't buy the new Ford Mach-E. You can only buy the Volkswagen whatever it is, right? Because you have to buy the one with the least amount of power consumption. These have long-term economic consequences. Yes, it starts out small. It's always small when it begins, right? It's just computers. But what about down the road when this starts to become something more? And how does that impact the economy, right? Because this is all the things that we're coming into as we start to move forward. 
in this particular case, when we get into the things about, you know, talking about how we have to make things, you know, it has to be fair and equal for everybody, right? Everybody's got to be treated equally. Okay. If I live in California, Washington, Washington, Vermont, et cetera, you know, I am unequal now relative to other parts of the country where I can buy what I want. So, again, th these have, you know, while these, these, these things seem to be, at least on the surface, they seem to be innocuous, these do potentially have the point of changing society and, again, limiting options you have. And the whole pur purpose of capitalism is to allow you to do the things that you want to do to create success, to create opportunity. But now, because we're moving into an environment where we have more government regulation and more control, your limitations of capitalism begin to get more and more limited. What you can say, what you can do, where you can go. And you see this everywhere right now. And interesting, this morning, PayPal's teaming up with the Anti-Defamation League. Now, that seems for, you know, fairly innocuous, right? We want to make sure that we eliminate hate speech. Great. I've got no problem with that at all. Until you start infringing on free speech. You know, here, here's, you know an interesting byproduct of all this is, is that Freedom of speech is your constitutional right. Yes, that's, that's no argument there. But we're going to say what speech you can say and what speech you can't say. See, I have the right to offend you, <laughs> and you have the right to be offended. That's freedom of speech. All of a sudden, we say, well, if I say something offensive to you, okay, well, now that's you know hate speech, right? So we can't say that anymore. And again, we start limiting the rights. And again, so this is that this is that slippery slope that we head down. And it seems innocuous on the surface, but this is the this is where you start to lose the benefits of capitalism. And again, it's all fairly innocuous on the surface, but this is how that transition from capitalism to socialism to communism begins. And it always begins this way. And this is how you get there. So again, you know, it's just one of those things to where, yes, it seems it's just a regular, it's a regulatory change, and now I can't buy a certain piece of equipment in certain states. So I just moved to another state, right? <laughs> That's pretty easy. I just moved to Texas. Everybody's moving to California to Texas anyway. Um, but where does it stop, right? Where's where's the next off ramp, so to speak, for this? All right, quick break, come back. A um, couple other things uh, with markets this morning in particular. Um, you know, as we start talking about, I just wrote an article on this, it'll be out on Monday. The peak of economic growth is in. Now, the question is, what happens next? And we come back from the break. This is something that we've been talking about for a while. Goldman Sachs just coming out with talking about the next hangover. And we'll touch on that when we come back from the break. Don't go away. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Back to our story this morning. All this has to do with economics, uh, ultimately, at the end of the day. Because, again, what drives economics is capitalism. And if you want to have strong economic growth, you need strong capitalistic trends in the economy and a strong capitalistic base. And that's the one thing that, you know, we've really worked hard at over the last decade of eroding by shifting more and more to a socialistic tendency in the economy. Now we're talking about this whole $5 trillion package 
of debt spending. Now, that $5 trillion, by the way, when they throw that number around, $3.5, $4 trillion, $5 trillion on human infrastructure, that's on top of the other money we already have to spend to support the economy, which is about $4 trillion. So we're talking about a budget of, you know, 9 to $10 trillion over the course of the next year to supply all of these spending programs that we want to spend money on. And so this is going to make it a, a much bigger challenge, you know, kind of going forward in terms of generating economic growth, because if you spend half of the economic environment in debt, so the economy is growing at roughly about $20 trillion, a little bit less. So you spend, say, another nine, you know, over the course of the next year, that's about 50% of the current outstanding economic size. And then, then the problem becomes, then what? Right? Then what? Because, again, once you do that, your economic payback, when that money leaves the system, goes away. Now, a lot of this is spread out over time, so it has a much less, uh, much less of an impact on economic growth because the economy will adjust for this additional money coming into the markets, prices of things will go up. You will have inflation uh, that is not transient. If you if you pass a package where you're paying for, you know, childcare and school and college and all these type of things, it sounds great on the surface. But again, just like we saw, if we didn't learn our lesson apparently from student loan debt. When the government took over student loans, we all complained about college tuition, you know, tripling, quadrupling. And, you know, just going through the roof, right? Because colleges are going, oh, government's paying for it? <laughs> no problem. We'll charge more, then we'll get more. And they did. Uh, colleges got rich from it. So we didn't learn our lesson. So now we're going to do this again by saying, hey, we'll pay for free college, right? Two years of junior college for free. So now everybody goes to junior college. Junior colleges go, yeah, well, you know, tuition to, you know, the junior college of Angleton <laughs> or whatever it is is $80,000 a, a year per student, right? You don't care because your kid's going for free. You're paying for it in tax dollars. So all this has a negative multiplier consequence within the economy. And, and again, this is kind of the point we've talked about coming up on, uh, I think some Monday I've got an article coming out talking about the peak of economic growth. Interest rates are already telling you that annual curves already telling you that we've seen the peak of economic growth. And this is also a point that Goldman Sachs was talking about this morning as well, saying that they're seeing a very sharp deceleration of economic growth in 2022, which is correct. Now, and by the way, this deceleration of economic growth is already occurring. We touched on this a little bit yesterday uh, at the open of the show. The Atlanta Fed started out April with estimates for GDP for the qu second quarter of this of this year, right? The quarter we're in, just finishing up. Their estimates were 13.5% growth for this quarter. We're going to see GDP this week come around 7.5, 7.6, according to the Atlanta Fed right now. So you've almost cut economic growth expectations in half in one quarter. So the deceleration of economic growth is already here. It's just going to get worse as we move further and further away from all the stimulus that we've done. Now, again, if we pass another $5 trillion or so, you're certainly going to get a little bit of bump of activity, and that's just going to kind of kick the can down the road a little bit, another 12 months. But eventually it all plays catch up. And you know, the, the further that we kick this can out, and the more debt that we run up, the slower the rate of economic growth is going to be. And the more of these policies that we continue to foster in the economy of things that really have no economic merit or base to them, they're simply feel-good policies, right? We just want to do this because that's what the political elite want us to do right now, right? We want to be more, 
you know, green or whatever it is. All these choices that we make are fine. There's nothing wrong with them. And I'm not saying that, you know, you should or you shouldn't. All I'm saying is they have consequences. And while they seem innocuous enough at first, they have long-term implications of changing the dynamic of capitalism. So, a couple of questions here uh, on our YouTube channel this morning. Why, uh, one, one, one good question here, when this is something that uh, Michael, Michael Ewitz and I have been talking a lot about lately is gold prices. And what drives gold prices is real rates. Real rates are interest rates, less inflation. Right now, you have negative real rates because of where inflation is and your interest rates are basically 1.3%, 1, 1. roughly, something like that right now. So you have a negative interest rate in the economy. But yet gold really isn't responding all that well to it. And that really has more to do with other factors than real rates. If it was an environment where real rates alone, and there's a, there's a very long high term, uh, very long term high correlation between real rates and gold. I mean, basically, if you've ever wanted to be a gold investor, all you did was look at real rates and that told you if you needed to be long or short gold. It's not working right now. There's a big deviation between real rates and gold. Why is that? That's because of this whole bubblicious environment that we've gotten ourselves into because gold is also a fear trade. I buy gold when I'm worried about economic collapse, catastrophe, stock market sell-offs, those type of things. Gold is my hedge, my fear hedge in my portfolio. Right now, there's no fear. So gold is not responding even to real rates. When will gold respond? You start getting a 5 to a 10 to a 20% correction in the markets. Gold are going to respond great. Problem is, is knowing the timing of when we get to that point that we will see that transition of fear back into the markets and we're not there yet. So, uh, again, you know, it's one of those things that is more of a timing issue right now uh, than a fundamental issue. Uh, good question, though. So one of the other things here is to how to reconcile peak earnings with the Fed and the Treasury's endless interest rate suppression. That's an interesting conundrum, right? This is what we think. We think that the Fed is actually suppressing interest rates, and that's not true. We've written some articles on this previously. When the Fed is engaged in QE, interest rates go up, not down. And why is that? The reason is because there is a trade-off of fear. And, and again, if the Fed is buying bonds, which they are, I don't want to be in bonds. I want to be in stocks. So I sell my bonds to the Fed and I go buy stocks. That causes interest rates to go up because there's this psychological transition between bonds being a, a safety trade versus a risk trade of equities. So it's a risk on trade. And so when the Fed is engaged in QE, and I've produced charts on this previously, but if you overlay a chart of the Fed balance sheet expansion versus interest rates, you'll see that during periods of QE, rates rise. When the Fed started doing QE in March, rates shot up sharply. Now, what happens is, is just before they start to taper, rates began to decline. Rates tend to lead the taper because the bond market starts to sniff it out. Bond market may be a little bit early this time. We'll see. I'm not sure that we're done with interest rates going up at this point. I think there's probably another leg higher at some point here over the course of the next you know few months to the next year. But we're likely closer or not to the next peak, particularly if economic growth begins to slow more. So it's, it's an interesting conundrum because we think that because the Fed's buying bonds, they're an artificial buyer that should suppress rates. And that's true in its, its theory, right? Because they are the buyer of treasuries. 
So they should suppress rates by doing that, but it actually works in reverse. Now, would interest rates be higher if the Fed wasn't buying bonds? Absolutely. So there is a suppression of rates because the Fed's buying bonds, but it doesn't make them dramatically lower. In other words, because the Fed's buying bonds right now, should interest rates be at zero? They would like it to be because that would <laughs> that would create massive, you know, economic speculation in the markets, right? Um, they can't control it that much. But it's a great question. It's something that we that we tend to deal with uh, a good bit. All right. Thanks for the questions and comments today. Um, also, um, we'll be back tomorrow for Wednesday show. Danny Ratliff will join in the morning. We'll get into some of the financial planning issues that we need to touch on about where we are in the economy right now, markets and more. So tune in tomorrow morning for that. Be sure and stick around for three minutes on markets and money, all coming up on our YouTube channel right here at realinvestmentadvice.com and also on the website. Our new blog post out this morning which is the next Minsky moment in the markets. On the website now, realinvestmentadvice.com. Have a great day. See you tomorrow. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet. Sign up for the Real Investment Report now at realinvestmentadvice.com. It's a rich man.